Savitri, Book 7, The Book of Yoga, Canto 2, The Parable of the Search for the Soul. In strange directions runs the intricate plan. Held back from human foresight is their end, and the far intention of some ordering will, or the order of life's arbitrary chance, finds out its settled poise and fated hour. Our surface, watched in vain by reason's gaze, invaded by the impromptus of the unseen, helpless records the accidents of time, the involuntary turns and leaps of life, only a little of us foresees its steps. Only a little has will and purposed pace. A vast subliminal is man's measureless part. The dim subconscient is his cavern base. Abolished vainly in the walks of time, our past lives still in our unconscious selves, and by the weight of its hidden influences is shaped our future's self-discovery. Thus all is an inevitable chain, and yet a series seems of accidents. The unremembering hours repeat the old acts, our dead past round our future's ankles clings and drags back the new nature's glorious stride. Or from its buried corpse, old ghosts arise, old thoughts, old longings, dead passions live again, recur in sleep or move the waking man to words that force the barrier of the lips, to deeds that suddenly start and o'erleap his head of reason and his guardian will. An old self lurks in the new self we are. Hardly we escape from what we once had been. In the dim gleam of habit's passages, in the subconscious darkling corridors, all things are carried by the porter nerves, and nothing checked by subterranean mind, unstudied by the guardians of the doors, and passed by a blind instinctive memory, the old gang dismissed, old cancelled passports serve. Nothing is wholly dead that once had lived. In dim tunnels of the world's being and in ours, the old rejected nature still survives. The corpses of its slain thoughts raise their heads and visit mind's nocturnal walks in sleep. Its stifled impulses breathe and move and rise. All keeps a phantom immortality, irresistible are nature's sequences. The seeds of sins renounced sprout from hid soil. The evil cast from our hearts once more we face. Our dead selves come to slay our living soul. A portion of us lives in present time, a secret mass in dim inconscience gropes. Out of the inconscient and subliminal, arisen, we live in mind's uncertain light and strive to know and master a dubious world 
whose purpose and meaning are hidden from our sight. Above us dwells a superconscient God, hidden in the mystery of his own light. Around us is a vast of ignorance, lit by the uncertain ray of human mind. Below us sleeps the inconscient, dark and mute. But this is only matter's first self-view, a scale and series in the ignorance. This is not all we are or all our world. Our greater self of knowledge waits for us, a supreme light in the truth conscious vast. It sees from summits beyond thinking mind. It moves in a splendid air transcending life. It shall descend and make earth's life divine. Truth made the world, not a blind nature force. For here are not our large diviner heights, our summits in the superconscious blaze are glorious with the very face of God. There is our aspect of eternity. There is the figure of the God we are. His young, unaging look on deathless things. His joy in our escape from death and time is immortality and light and bliss. Our larger being sits behind cryptic walls. There are greatnesses hidden in our unseen parts that wait their hour to step into life's front. We feel an aid from deep indwelling gods. One speaks within, light comes to us from above. Our soul, from its mysterious chamber, acts. Its influence, pressing on our heart and mind, pushes them to exceed their mortal selves. It seeks for good and beauty and for God. We see beyond self's walls our limitless self. We gaze through our world's glass at half-seen vasts. We hunt for the truth behind apparent things. Our inner mind dwells in a larger light. Its brightness looks at us through hidden doors. Our members luminous grow and wisdom's face appears in the doorway of the mystic ward. When she enters into our house of outward sense, then we look up and see above her son. A mighty life self with its inner powers supports the dwarfish modicum we call life. It can graft upon our crawl two puissant wings. Our body's subtle self is throned within, in its viewless palace of veridical dreams that are bright shadows of the thoughts of God. In the prone, obscure beginnings of the race, the human grew in the bowed, ape-like man. He stood erect, a godlike form and force, and a soul's thoughts looked out from earth-born eyes. Man stood erect. He wore the thinker's brow. He looked at heaven and saw his comrade stars. A vision came of beauty and greater birth, slowly emerging from the heart's chapel of light and moved 
in a white, lucent air of dreams. He saw his being's unrealized vastnesses. He aspired and housed the nascent demigod out of the dim recesses of the self. The occult seeker into the open came. He heard the far and touched the intangible. He gazed into the future and the unseen. He used the powers earth instruments cannot use, a pastime made of the impossible. He caught up fragments of the omniscient's thought. He scattered formulas of omnipotence. Thus man, in his little house made of earth's dust, grew towards an unseen heaven of thought and dream, looking into the vast vistas of his mind on a small globe dotting infinity. At last, climbing a long and narrow stair, he stood alone on the high roof of things and saw the light of a spiritual sun aspiring he transcends his earthly self. He stands in the largeness of his soul newborn, redeemed from encirclement by mortal things, and moves in a pure, free, spiritual realm as in the rare breath of a stratosphere. A last end of far lines of divinity. He mounts by a frail thread to his high source. He reaches his fount of immortality. He calls the Godhead into his mortal life. All this the spirit concealed had done in her. A portion of the mighty mother came into her as into its own human part. Amid the cosmic workings of the gods, it marked her the center of a wide-drawn scheme, dreamed in the passion of her far-seeing spirit to mold humanity into God's own shape and lead this great, blind, struggling world to light or a new world discover or create. Earth must transform herself and equal heaven, or heaven descend into Earth's mortal state. But for such vast spiritual change to be, out of the mystic cavern in man's heart, the heavenly psyche must put off her veil and step into common nature's crowded rooms and stand uncovered in that nature's front and rule its thoughts and fill the body and life. Obedient to a high command, she sat. Time, life, and death were passing incidents, obstructing with their transient view her sight, her sight that must break through and liberate the God, imprisoned in the visionless mortal man. The inferior nature, born into ignorance, still took too large a place. It veiled herself and must be pushed aside to find her soul. End of Canto 2